Hey there. Subscribe to my channel. And also press this bell icon. So you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Now the statement of objects and reasons uh, of this bill states that the existing laws do not recognize trafficking of persons for the purpose of physical and other forms of exploitation and this is simply factually incorrect. In fact all the new offenses that the bill creates under the term aggravated trafficking that the minister mentioned are already covered under the ambit of section 370 IPC and other provisions. In other words, this is a rehash of existing laws and we must face it for what it is. One of the cardinal principles involved in drafting legislation is to study how the existing laws have been applied so that the new laws can improve not only upon the old laws but upon any unintended consequences, any difficulties and failings of the previous laws. The bill heavily relies on the definition of trafficking provided under Section 370 of the IPC. However, a study of 125 appellate cases just in the last five years, between 2013 and 2018, shows that this provision and Section 370A has been applied liberally by the police and the courts, going well beyond the legislative intent of those provisions as a proxy for wrongful confinement. Even a case, one case of these many cases where a woman left her husband and lived with another man along with her child had tracked this provision of trafficking. This provision has also been used to target sex workers. I've mentioned this to the minister. Most of them are marginalized and vulnerable women in our society. So my big critique is not just to say the lack of safeguards in all the provisions in the bill. The legal system unfortunately conflates the fine distinction between those women who are trafficked into sex work and adult consenting sex workers. There is no doubt that our society views sex work negatively, prejudicially, through a moralistic lens, but as the Supreme Court has just reminded us in a different context, we as legislators need to view matters of rights and laws through the lens of constitutional morality and not majoritarian social morality. Irrespective of our individual views, I do not think anyone can accept the idea of harassing people who voluntarily engage in sex trade or into their economic condition. As it is, Section 370 of the IPC is used extensively against sex workers in conjunction with ITPA. There are numerous instances in which the police have threatened sex workers and they've cited these laws to threaten them, demanding bribes and even demanding sex from these poor women. Unfortunately, this bill has no safeguards against such misuse. Let us keep in mind that the success of the HIV awareness programs, for example, if we want to ensure the success of those programs, if we want to root out trafficking in sex work, we need to cooperate with sex worker collectives. If we fail to place enough safeguards against misuse, the law will only drive them further underground and jeopardize our public health programs and the larger fight against trafficking. Now, even if the bill does not expressly mention sex work, ah yes, it seems the camera <laughs> is not looking at the speaker. I hope it is hearing us. Sir, we are seeing you, we are seeing you extensively, but not the speaker of the bill. <laughs> but for a couple of minutes. Nonetheless, even if the bill doesn't expressly mention sex work, phrases such as resulting in pregnancy or causing exposure to HIV can be used to bring it under the ambit of the law. Similarly, the use of phrases such as administration of hormones in the bill can be used to, to target transgender persons, since many of them take hormones during their process of gender affirmation. And since some medical practitioners are unwilling to do so on their behalf, they at times self-administer these substances. Transgender persons also work in collectives and they unfortunately often have to engage in begging due to the lack of opportunities available to them. This bill criminalizes trafficking for the purpose of begging and since Section 370 has been widely applied in the past, I fear this provision will now be used to target transgender groups because they beg as often as they do. The bill uses phrases such as may lead to trafficking 
or likely to be used for trafficking in penal provisions. Now, how can we have language like this in a, something that criminalizes and imposes punishment? Likely, maybe. We must have a clear nexus between an act and an offense. That's how laws are supposed to be written. These provisions can be struck down by the judiciary even as being unconstitutional because vagueness in the definition of criminal offenses can be applied arbitrarily and would therefore violate Article 14 of the Constitution. This is a recent ruling of Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India and the court has taken a clear line on this. The bill, as the Honorable Minister mentioned, creates a new offense of aggravated trafficking. And this attracts at least 10 years of imprisonment and may extend to life imprisonment. Now, this is in addition to the existing definition of Section 370 of the IPC, definition of trafficking, and therefore it's supposed to be more serious in nature, otherwise what makes it aggravated? But the logical fallacy of this gradation, Mr. Chairman, is completely apparent when you look at the bill, because it says that trafficking for the purposes of begging is an aggravated offence, but trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation is a general offence. So what is the difference? Why is begging worse than, um, than exploiting women sexually? What is this aggravated trafficking all about? It is distressing to note that Clause 16 of the bill, which allows for medical examination of the victims, including to assess their illnesses, fails to mention that the consent of the victim shall be taken as and when practical. Now, this is particularly relevant, Mr. Chairman, for victims who may be suffering from HIV AIDS, because there have been instances when medical results have been shared with the courts without the consent of these persons, and the courts have unfortunately ruled that such persons must remain in rehabilitation homes as their families cannot take care of them, forcing them thereby to be torn apart from their loved ones. And I've got the details of the minister that is interested in such cases. Now let's look at rehabilitation, which again the minister, the honorable minister mentioned as a serious important element. This bill sadly reiterates the failed method of institutional rehabilitation. We need to make sure that people who do not want to be in these homes are not forcefully incarcerated in them. In fact, a recent study has revealed that out of a sample of 243 women picked up in raids in Maharashtra, 193 were adult consenting sex workers who were incarcerated in rehabilitation homes against their wishes. Some of these women were kept in these homes for nearly three years. The only beneficiaries of this provision are the people running those homes. They're not the victims. I understand the bill also empowers the magistrate to release victims from these homes if they can apply for the same. But there is no requirement for the magistrate to hear them in person before deciding on the merits of their case. Nor is there an appeal procedure provided if the, if the magistrate rejects the application. If anything, in fact, the proviso in section 17.4 even allows the magistrate to disregard the wishes of an adult victim if he or she, magistrate, is not convinced that it's been made voluntarily. This is a paternalist measure, unworthy of the Honorable Minister, which denies the agency of the victim. Now, these homes can be places of mental and physical torture, Mr. Chairman. I must say that the interesting thing is that the, this bill has gone through many drafts. And the earlier draft we saw, the fourth draft, had provisions which mandated monthly inspections of these homes because we clearly need regular assessments of the quality of these homes. Even the Supreme Court appointed panel had stated that the type of vocational training provided in these homes fails to provide the skills necessary for basic sustenance. And that draft of the bill also had beneficial provisions such as giving the victim timely notice of trials, giving them the power to summon materials, periodic review of the protection of the victims, mandating the government to take immediate action against anyone harassing the victims. Unfortunately, the present bill has dropped all these provisions. Clearly some vested interests have inter intervened. The people involved in these homes don't want to be inspected. They don't want to be held to account. I urge the minister to retain these provisions which help victims of trafficking in the long run. They were in her draft, she can easily restore them again. Bonded labor, Mr. Chairman, is a prevalent form of trafficking in our country. Steps must be taken to enforce the mandate of the Bonded Labor System Abolition Act of 1976. Despite its uh, poor implementation, the Act of 1976 is revolutionary 
It lays importance on the rehabilitation of the victims of bonded labor by recognizing their agency while providing them economic assistance. However, this rights-based approach of the Act may be weakened by the institutional method of rehabilitation favored by the present bill, particularly Clause 59, which states that the provisions of this bill will have an overriding effect over the provisions of any other statutes if conflict arises. So even the more progressive language of the bonded labor bill can be overridden by this retrogressive bill. It's a disgrace, Mr. Chairman. In fact, this government could have even used an existing model in the Prohibition of Employment as Manual Scavengers Act and their Rehabilitation Act of 2013, which was passed by the then UPA government. This bill fails to replicate this model, even though it lays emphasis on, pro emphasis on providing assistance to victims and respecting their agency while empowering them. That's the sort of model this government should follow, but unfortunately, the bill today before us fails to replicate any of these core principles. So we are going backwards in this bill from progressive legislation already adopted by this parliament in recent years. The bill establishes a rehabilitation fund for a wide range of activities. The minister rightly mentioned that, such as providing legal aid, housing, skill development, and rehabilitation of victims of trafficking. Interestingly, this discarded fourth draft of the bill had a clause mandating the government to allot budgetary allocations to this fund. But this bill mysteriously drops that request. As for the, per the financial memorandum attached to the bill, Mr. Chairman, a paltry sum of 10 crores has been allotted by the government to the rehabilitation fund. Whereas this government is a government that has spent 4,343 crores on publicity and advertising alone since it came to power in May 2014. And for women and children victims of whom the minister speaks so emotionally, 10 crores has been allotted. In fact, 10 crores is the same amount given to one more bureaucratic institution of which our country has too many, namely the National Anti-Trafficking Bureau. And that amount goes up to 25 crores in the second and third year for the bureaucracy, whereas renewal of the rehabilitation fund is only assured on an as-needed basis. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, unambiguously to the minister, this is a bill of the bureaucracy drafted by the bureaucracy and for the bureaucracy. The victims are the lowest priority in this bill. Now I want to get to the very important issue of prevention because the bill claims to place measures to prevent trafficking. It's actually stated as the very first in the objects and reasons of what this bill is trying to accomplish. But there is only one clause in the entire bill which deals with preventive measures. Just one clause. These measures are broad and very vaguely worded. And I'll quote some. Developing appropriate law and order framework to ensure prevention of trafficking of persons. What is this appropriate law and order framework? Are we going to give the Sarkar a complete blank check? Coordinating with corporate sector to implement various schemes, programs for the prevention and trafficking of persons. Are we now through the law empowering a nameless set of companies to profit from dealing with the trafficking of persons? It fails to give any vision or policy to prevent trafficking. But I suspect this may even be deliberate on the part of the drafters because placing vague obligations in a law makes it even more difficult to hold the government accountable. And then there is a well-accepted distinction that troubles me that has been ignored by the government in talking about the migration perspective. The distinction between human trafficking, I just need another three, four minutes, Mr. Chair, five minutes. The distinction between human trafficking and the smuggling of migrants is well established in international law. Trafficking in persons, that is the kind of thing we are trying to outlaw in the bill today, involves the use of either deception or coercion to exploit the victim, either within their own country, in this case our country, or transnationally, as the Honorable Minister mentioned Nepal as an example. Whereas in the case of smuggling of migrants, there is no coercion or deception. The smugglers are facilitating the irregular crossing of international borders with the consent of the migrant. Very often the migrant pays money to an agent or a syndicate to smuggle them across a border to another country. Now the relationship between the smuggler and the migrant therefore is not exploitative in nature. It is symbiotic. But the relationship between the trafficker and the migrant is exploitative. That distinction has to be observed and is completely missing in the intent of the bill. 
smuggling of migration often takes place due to dire economic conditions. We know that. The UN member states as far back as 75 agreed to avoid the word illegal in relation to migration. In fact, there is a draft global compact for migration that has just been negotiated with India agreeing to it. It was finished the negotiation this month and will be adopted at the UN in December. And this global compact makes a clear distinction between smuggling of migrants and human trafficking in judicial prosecutions, policy and legislation. Even though these activities may both be offenses, it will be unfair and disproportionate to club the two while imposing penal consequences. So again, I request the minister to look again at the bill. Clause 3111 of the bill mentions trafficking by encouraging any person to migrate illegally into India or Indians into other countries as aggravated trafficking. So thereby it conflates trafficking with smuggling of migrants in violation of international law and human rights principles. And once again, India is just agreeing to a global compact. And then we are passing a bill today that will undermine what we have agreed to that we are going to ratify in December. Now let me conclude with a few suggestions, Mr. Chairman. The bill talks about the repatriation of victims of trafficking. However, it completely ignores the fact that victims of trafficking also have families. Repatriation only means under the law that the government will transfer the victim from one state to another, to their own home state. But the bill should have actually prescribed restoration, which mandates the government to help the victim reunite with his or her family from which they have been separated, rather than merely leaving them in a limbo in the state of origin. This must only be undertaken if the adult victim wishes to return to his or her home. We need to recognize that trafficking is not merely a law and order issue. It has its roots in socio-economic realities of our country and our neighboring countries. By weakening our labor laws, denying Munrega workers their wages, you make people more vulnerable. And those are the ones who end up being exploited by trafficking. So we need to also have some sense of responsibility to improve the socio-economic condition of our women and children. 